Okay. The clock is going, so I think I have to start talking now. Welcome, everybody, uh, to uh, this talk. We're going to be talking about data reliability engineering and uh, how to have a different approach to data quality than what you might be used to. Ho I hope you're all here to listen about data quality. If not, you're going to sit through this for 40 minutes. The doors have been locked from the outside. I'm just kidding. They're still open. All right. We're going to go through a quick introduction. We're going to talk about how we got here from generally the data landscape, what data reliability engineering is, and where it is now, and maybe a couple of tips on how you can get started. So this is me. I am the co-founder and uh, CTO at BigEye. Before this, I was at Uber. Uh, I was one of the first people called the data engineer at Uber, responsible for standing up the original data warehouse, doing a lot of the early ETL um, uh, work, BI work, migrations, so on and so forth. Um, and later on went to do a lot of analytics and internal tooling at Uber. Uh, Big Eye is a data observability company. We uh, worry a lot about data quality, and we want to build the right tools to help you have the highest quality data possible. And so why do we uh, care about data quality? Because bad data is expensive. And it is a problem, and everybody has the problem of bad data. We had this problem at Uber. I had this problem before that. Um, before that. Anybody I, I have spoken with in the data space says that they have data quality problems. If you do not have data quality problems, I want to talk to you and find out how you got there. But bad data is really expensive. Um, everyone loves this Gartner uh, number. $13 million a year is wasted on data quality uh, problems. And big eyes small. We don't have $13 million to spend on data quality problems, which means someone's going to go spend $26 million on behalf of us. Um, and data quality is a problem not just from a revenue perspective, but for compliance reasons. And really, at the end of the day, as a data engineer, what mattered to me the most is wasting my time having to go through all my pipelines, debug them, understand where things are coming from. Uh, I did not enjoy that. That was the least enjoyable part of my job. And we at Big Eye want to build tools so that data engineers don't have to waste their time on data quality problems. But before we, before we talk about data reliability engineering, it's important for us to understand why data quality is such a big problem nowadays. How did we even get here? Well, the data ecosystem and data engineering has been evolving, and it's been evolving and mirroring the patterns that we have seen in software engineering. So if you think back 20 years, um, early 2000s, software engineering was, and cloud infrastructure was in, in its infancy. You had AWS, and you had um, a Git, and you had um, GCP started uh, up a little bit later. But software engineering started with cloud infrastructure. And cloud infrastructure allowed software engineers to stop putting physical servers in physical racks in the closet and be able to scale how they build and develop software. Fast forward 10 years, Snowflake, Redshift, BigQuery, Databricks, are, are starting to form and forming that cloud infrastructure layer for data teams. Now, at Uber, our data warehouse was Vertica. We had physical servers in a physical rack, and we managed the hardware and infrastructure itself. The times have changed. Nobody does that. We're all here because of Databricks, because I can go push a button and spin up a cluster and just start doing compute and workloads without even thinking about where they're running, what the server uh, specs are, how it's all managed. So great. Infrastructure is easy now. What's the next step? For software, it was frameworks. It's frameworks that allow you to utilize the cloud to be more efficient. You had build tools. You had um, deploy tools. You had frameworks to write uh, code faster, to build uh, microservices faster. And that allowed software teams to leverage the scalability and the ease of use of cloud infrastructure to g develop much, much faster. Again, if we fast forward into the data space about 10 years or so, 
What about d data frameworks? Well, you have Airflow, Fivetran, DBT, TensorFlow, Dagster, frameworks that allow you to very quickly create data products, to create e ETLs and jobs that are necessary for you to move data around, to consolidate it, to get it in one place, to transform it, and if, start building data products. And running these frameworks on the cloud infrastructure makes things go much faster. So now I have infinitely scalable, very easily accessible infrastructure, and I have frameworks that I can use repeatedly to build new data products. So before a team of 10 and data engineers might be able to manage dozens of pipelines, 100 pipelines if they're, uh, if they're really good and have built their own internal frameworks. And now we're seeing data teams of two or three people use uh, just spinning up uh, uh, Databricks and using Fivetran and DBT and uh, uh, drop Tableau, Looker, another, an EBI tool on top of it, and now you have a team of two people that can all of a sudden manage the same number of pipelines and the same number of uh, data products, which then leads to the problem of scaling the data team and understanding what is going on inside of those pipelines. What is going on with their data products? In the software space, this was the same thing. I have built a lot of services and I've deployed them to the cloud and they're all running, but how do I know that they're running? And how do I know that they're uh, doing what I expect them to do? Datadog, PagerDuty, New Relic, AppDynamics, Dynatrace, solve this problem for software. Big Eye, along with uh, other, uh, other companies, is solving this for the data space. How do you know that your data is doing what you expect it to do? And so typically this has been a data quality problem, and data quality meant hiring people to verify the reports, look at, look at the numbers every day, if anything looks wrong, go and investigate that. But as I mentioned, we can't scale this way. The data systems and the data products and the platforms are scaling much faster than we can hire and onboard new people. So we need tools to help solve this, but we don't just need tools, we also need to have a different mindset about how to think about data quality. So enter data reliability engineering. Now, this is the one, one chart that I like to show that really depicts why this is such a problem now. Infrastructure, as I mentioned, is now easy. Analytics is now easy. You can drop a BI tool anywhere. Machine learning is actually now really easy, too. Um, and everyone gets super excited about all the data and doing something with the data. And then they're like, oh no, my data engineering team is two people. What about how do I know where this data is coming from? Who owns it? Who's going to respond to problems? Is it good? Who should have access to it? Where's the PII? The whole operations layer is just completely unsolved. And then every data team just ends up backtracking and saying, oh, we did all this cool stuff, and now we need to build the foundation. Ideally, the foundation should already exist. And it doesn't have to be hard, but it is a combination of tools and process that you need to have in order to have reliability in your data products, in the analytics and the machine learning. So let's talk about data reliability engineering. Show of hands, who knows, who here understands what site reliability is? Going back to the software space. About a quarter, a fifth, yeah, a quarter, yeah, great. So let's start there. What's site reliability engineering? SRE is a, series, a set of practices and principles that you can apply to software engineering in order to help create scalable and highly reliable software systems. And SRE what came from Google. Google wrote the SRE Bible, really. And there's this huge book that talks about the seven principles of SRE that I have listed here. Embracing risk, know that things are gonna break. They will, it's a fact of life. Set the standards for what you expect your systems to perform. Reduce the toil by automating as, uh, as much as possible. You shouldn't be doing re repetitive work. Monitor everything so that you know when something actually breaks. Use automation to solve your, the problems for you. Control your releases so you're not unpleasantly surprised when something goes wrong. Uh, and favor simplicity because 
difficult tools are difficult to implement, no one wants to use them, and therefore that process will never be followed. Data reliability engineering applies all the same principles. The same concepts that SRE applies to software systems, data reliability engineering is intended to apply to data products and data systems. In the one sentence that I, I like to use to summarize this is treating data quality like it's an engineering problem. Taking all of those hard won le learned lessons from software engineering, from SRE, and turning them into useful practices and uh, useful uh, processes in the data space. So then your data can be reliable and your teams can move quickly and trust the fact that they're on stable ground whenever they make any sorts of changes. So data reliability engineering is really a subset of what we talked about earlier. If you remember the couple slides earlier, data ops, that operations layer, is so what, I, what, what I would consider the whole space. It encompasses everything that has to do with working on data and providing necessary information about the data to work with it. So data ops encompasses things like cost management, governance, uh, data discovery and understand, uh, understanding, documentation, performance. All of this is encompassed in data operations. And there are data ops teams, and there's a suite of tools beyond data observability um, that fall into the data operations category, data catalogs and cost management tools. These are all useful tools to have on top of the infrastructure to make sure that you know what your data looks like and you can trust your data products. So within that world of data operations, we have data reliability engineering. It's meant to cover the, the parts that deal with understanding how reliable the data is. And there's more to data operations, but data, a DRE covers things like pipe test automation and uh, uh, pipeline tests, creating SLAs and um, SL, SLIs and SLOs for your data products, doing incident management. When something goes wrong, what, what are your practices? How do data problems get escalated? Who finds out about them? Who responds to them? How do they track them? So da data reliability engineering is sort of this subset. Now, I said earlier, Big Eye is a data observability company. Well, where's data observability in all of this? Why am, I, why am I even doing this talk then? Well, data observability is a necessary subset of data reliability engineering. Data observability helps answer the question of what is going on in your data. It's about alerting you when something looks wrong. It's about the lineage and understanding where those problems are coming from. What are they impacting? It's about collecting the metadata to understand what the systems look like and collecting these metrics over time, understanding these trends, and giving you visibility into your whole data process and into your whole data space. Now, data observability is not all of data reliability engineering. Big Eye doesn't solve, magically solve data reliability uh, for, uh, for your company just by providing data observability. Because the important part to understand is the data reliability engineering encompasses the practices and the processes that you create around this tooling. Big Eye creates the signals. Big Eye can tell you what your data looks like. But your teams need to be bought in and have the sorts of understanding and processes in place to deal with that information, to respond appropriately, to treat things in a timely manner, and to have visibility and surface that visibility back up to the business. So DRE is... A, fair, a fairly new concept. Where is it now? So what's the state of it today? And oh, here I'm gonna go through a couple of examples that I've seen out in the wild, uh, and then a couple of tips on how to actually get through there. So I've color-coded the principles a little bit about, uh, based on my own feelings and observations uh, in the 
uh, in the data space about where we as a, a data culture are around data reliability engineering. So let's go through these one by one and, um, and see where we are. So embracing risk. I think everyone has at this point realized that data things will break. Your dashboard will break. Your machine learning model will break. Your pipeline will fail. If anyone in this room doesn't actually believe that, then you're in for a very rude awakening at some point in the near future. Um, we're good on that. Great. We, as, a, we as, a da as data practitioners have embraced risk, and this is good. Setting standards a little is a little bit in the middle. There are some standards. We've uh, tried to standardize a lot of concepts around uh, companies will standardize metrics and have metric repositories and have some uh, definitions around what processes should look like. DBT does a great job of actually creating standards around how to do uh, modeling and what it, what it should look like and how to document it. Um, so there's pockets of, of standardization around there. But there's no real standard around what is high quality data. Every vendor is gonna tell you a different thing. Every vendor is gonna uh, talk about their own approach, in, including us. But um, there is no unified data, uh, data standard for what is high quality, what is reliable. Every team kind of decides that for themselves. It's a little bit of a mix of are my pipelines running? Are my dashboards updating on time? Is there the right values? Is anything drastically shifting that it shouldn't? But everyone kind of comes up with their own definition. So a little, bit, a little bit here and there. It's in the middle. Reducing toils in the red. Data teams are really bad at <laughs> reducing their own work. I was a data engineer. I was on call. People would just slack me something and say, here is a query, go fix it, and then I get to fix the query. And I just rinse and repeat that process. Um, there are, really, there are not a lot of tools right now out there for reducing toil holistically across the whole uh, data landscape. There are definitely buttons that data engineers push and data scientists push and analysts push that they don't have to push. A machine could do it for them and send them, send them a report. We're just not there yet. And I think part of that is because we, have, we as, a data, as data practitioners have not created enough standards to understand Great, what buttons are we, is everyone pushing all at the same time, and can we just start pushing those buttons for, for ourselves? Monitoring everything's in the yellow. Uh, I like to think that Big Eye helps contribute to this. We, uh, teams have started to really think about data quality and reliability, and started monitoring their processes. Job monitoring is well understood. It's well understood how to alert when a job has failed. Data monitoring is a little bit further behind. Big Eye tries to help with that. Cost monitoring has actually started coming up. There are a number of startups now talking about cloud cost management and monitoring how much spend you have. So monitoring is getting there. Automation's sort of in the yellow. Um, job automation is great. Very easy to um, automate pipelines now. It's very easy to create um, DAGs and go and uh, execute things in order, and r jobs will run daily, and that's all fine. Everyone's happy. Um, but there is still not a lot of automation around the failure points. This is where all that toil comes in. When a job fails, what, what happens? You wake up, you get paged, you open your laptop, and you go to your airflow, and you rerun the job. And then you close your laptop, and you go back to sleep. That could be automated, and that's a lot of toil. Uh, so in the worst case scenario, we as data practitioners still are not great at the automation. We're good at the, in the happy path automation, just not good in the not so happy path. Um, controlling releases is, a, is, a, is in red. How many people here actually control changes to their data today? Good, good. But there are parts of data that are easily controlled. You can control ET, uh, changes to um, an ETL, to ETL logic, to your model tables. DBT uh, uh, advocates for analytics engineers that 
uh, analytics engineering that talks about controlling how you deploy your models, version control them, make changes predictably, but there's still a large, large, large number of teams that simply make changes, and then something downstream will break, and there is no notion of like, why did this break? Did this break at the same time? Now we do time-based correlation around, oh great, my dashboard stopped refreshing at one, and then I, I see that Steve over here made a change to his DBT job at 12, maybe that's related. If there was a message that said, I'm about to release a change, it is going to impact dashboards A, B, and C, that would be much easier. Finally, favoring simplicity, again, yellow because some things are really, really simple. DBT makes the, some things very simple. Airflow makes other things very uh, simple. Infrastructure is fairly easy and well understood and you don't have to worry about like, if I create a table in Databricks, what does that look like? What hardware is it running around? Where is the storage happening? Kind of just abstract it out for us. But again, there's no simplicity on the, on the not so happy path. In, in the worst case scenario, everything is massively convoluted in a one-off case, and there are pages and pages and pages and pages of documentation that say, if this job failed and this thing happened, and then go check with this, and then go call Mike, and then maybe he'll tell you the secret password for you to log into the server to find out where, where the problem's happening. It's all interrelated. Building better tools, that are easy to use, easy to understand, and don't require human input is really the goal here. And that is how you create a data reliability standard. So let's talk about a couple of examples of this in the wild. Let's talk about how you can start implementing this, and then I will open it up for Q&A. So a couple of examples of data reliability engineering in practice and the sorts of processes and tools that got created around it. Um, great blog post by Intuit called Circuit Breakers. So this is about five, six years old now. Um, this is simple. They described their whole process and their whole system in one diagram with two boxes and four lines. It, and Circuit Breakers, Intuit uses Circuit Breakers to say things are gonna break, and when things break, I want to stop everything, and I want to know about it, and I don't want those problems to keep propagating down. They've embraced risk. They've said things are going to break. They automate the, the stopping of their pipelines, and the system's very simple to explain. You're gonna write a check. If that check fails, we're gonna stop everything. We close, we, uh, close the circuit. So uh, that is, that's an, that's an example of DRE in, in practice. Now, not every DRE solution needs to encompass every single principle. Like I said, it's a set of practices. It's a set of standards and processes and tools that in combination should be following all of the principles and giving you a holistic view on your data reliability and helping you along your data reliability practices. Intuit has other tools, I'm sure, internally that help with the other, reducing toil, with monitoring. This one follows the other, the th these three principles. Let's talk about Airbnb. Um, Midas. Midas at Airbnb um, is a pro project. It's not a tool. This is a screenshot from their internal data catalog. It's literally a gold stamp that says, this data set is certified. We, you can trust this data set. People have thought a lot about it. People have written a lot of tests about it. It is monitored, it is covered, it is well understood, and we will guarantee, we, the data engineering team, will guarantee the accuracy and reliability of this data set over time. They set standards. To be MIDAS certified, you need to have specific standards in place. You need to have tests in place. You need to understand what, your what the table looks like. You need to understand when it changes. You need to control the releases. Thing, you can't willy-nilly change the logic for that table. You have to follow a certain process and a certain release uh, cadence. And I love this example because this is the ultimate example of simplicity. There's no engineering behind, behind my, the concept of MIDAS. It's a process. 
They literally write a sentence in their data catalog and they're like, this is MIDAS certified. But as a user, as a data user, I can see this and I can say, great, I now immediately trust this because I understand the implication and what has gone be, uh, what is behind this certification. Um, UDQ coming out of, uh, uh, coming out of Uber. We did not favor simplicity. This chart is uh, uh, bonkers. But um, Uber had an outstanding system for doing, not just running the test, not just understanding when things break, but also automating things like notification, automating things like lineage tracking, automating surfacing this information to the end users through the querying tools, through the cataloging tools, all of that was automated. So we, Uber was, in, with this, embracing risk. They um, understood that things are gonna fail, and when things fail, we, the people who are relying on the data, the data consumers, want, need to know about it. But they need to know about it in a way that's automatable and scalable. Because at Uber, we had I think something like 14,000 data sets when I, when I left in 2019. And sure, not all of them were in constant use, but still, let's say half of them were. That's 7,000 tables. You're not gonna have a data engineer sit there and email half the company every time one of those 7,000 tables breaks. So the goal here was to reduce the toil and use this automation to say, run the checks, if something fails, here is how you notify every consumer of this. Every user in every tool that they might be interacting with this data needs to know about it, and we need to record this and surface it to them. And so this is a great example of a tool that Uber built to help with data reliability and, and, uh, and that practice. Obviously, there were processes around this, what tests make sense, how do you determine who, who the consumers are, so on and so forth. It's all in combination. So let's get started with DRE yourself. You don't have to go build UDQ, you don't have to uh, build Midas, you don't, need a, you don't even need a big team, you, don't, you need one person. If you're a solo data engineer at a, at a startup and you feel the weight of the world on your shoulders because you went and you enabled a bunch of jobs in Fivetran and now you're syncing 100 different pipelines into your Databricks, let, let, let me help you with that. So let's go through the principles and see how you can get started. Embrace risk. Have a process for when something goes wrong. Things will go wrong. Just write down a process. Maybe that process is I go into Slack and I do at here in a data channel and I say at here this table is broken. It's a process. Is it great? No. You could probably come up with something better. But you can get started. Just some well understood way of communicating the fact that we know that things will break and we have, understand that and we will communicate that effectively. Set the standards. Going back to that communication, that is the best practice. So document these best practices. Work with your stakeholders. Work with your, the rest of your team. What are the right practices for your organization? How do you create standards that the data team will follow, both the producers and the consumers, and the, and the end users in the business? Reduce toil. This is where we get into the actual engineering parts of it. You can run some scripts to, to perform common actions. No, instead of writing a Slack message by hand every single time, let's go back to that example, uh, maybe I just write a little, a little bash script and I have a command line tool that says, cool, give me, a, give me a table name and I'm just gonna automatically write the Slack message, send it to the right channels. Great, I reduced some of my toil. I don't have to craft a new message every time because I have set the standards, I've documented how I'm gonna communicate this, and I'm just gonna uh, reduce the amount of buttons that I need to push. Monitor everything. Just track your assumptions. Let's start there. Maybe you don't have to, you don't have to buy a data observability tool. I really wish you did, and I really wish it was big eye, but you don't have to. Let's just start with your assumptions. Every time, the, every data set that you have, you make some sort of assumptions. How often it updates, how many records there should be. Um, ask your data uh, consumers, ask your stakeholders. What's important about this data? What assumptions are you making? Are you assuming that email addresses are unique? 
are you assuming that there is, prices can never be below zero? Great, let's start writing some of those down, let's start tracking those. It can be very, it can be manual to begin with, and then as you understand what assumptions are necessary and make sense for your organization, we can start using automation. Take all those things that you just did, tracking the assumptions, scr uh, scripting away um, your uh, labor, having these processes, and start integrating that into your existing stack. If your stack is Databricks, Looker, DBT, then uh, Fivetran, maybe your assumptions are, well, Fivetran is syncing all, uh, all of my data every hour. Great, that is an assumption. Now, in my stack, I might be saying, great, DBT is gonna rerun my models every hour because they're gonna, it's gonna pull in from, uh, the new data from Fivetran. Well, let me just write a quick pre-check that says, just make sure that the data's at least an hour early. You created your assumptions, you scripted away some actions, and you've started integrating into your stack, so these things start happening automatically. Next up, let's, you can control your releases. Just test your data, test your data loads. Make sta create staging tables. Create staging tables for changes. If you're gonna go update an ETL, maybe, or you're gonna update uh, any sort of external data load, maybe load it to a side table. Then compare that to the production table. And don't be afraid to roll back. Part of releasing and part of having a release process includes rolling back. It's not defeat. You don't, it's, there's nothing shameful in saying, I made a mistake, this shouldn't go to production. You can roll your code back, you can switch it back to the original state. And uh, finally, favoring simplicity. We talked a lot about documentation and process. Put stuff in Google Docs. You don't need a full-on catalog. You don't need a full-on like, process and like, a build an internal tool for all this documentation, service all this information. Drop stuff into Google Docs. Microsoft, if, sorry, if you're a Microsoft shop, Microsoft uh, Docs. Um, just start putting it somewhere that's generally accessible, well understood, and isn't too much work for you. The, mo the hardest part about reliability and quality is starting. And so if you make it easy for yourself to start, then you're gonna go far. Thank you, everyone. We